afternoon, folks, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff Moser. Uh, I am, and welcome to the From the Ground Up live podcast. Um, this is also the sustaining ensemble-based work uh, uh, session. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the work that I've been able to do with the From the Ground Up podcast um, throughout this uh, entire, for the past year or more. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the genesis of the work, where it came from, how the, how the podcast became. Um, I'm also gonna, uh, we also have a great opportunity to interview a group, uh, Flux Theater Ensemble from New York City. They are with us today, and we're going to be interviewing uh, Corinna Schulenberg and Rachel Cohn, uh, who are going to specifically talk about their living ticket model uh, that I'm really excited to learn about. Um, I want to say, first of all, this is being live streamed right now on HowlRound.com. So, hello. Hi, how are you doing? Make some noise. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, theater people, here we are, right? Um, so we are being live streamed right now, so, uh, if it, but if you do feel like you need to do anything to stay present, stand up, walk around, stretch a little bit, that's okay, I appreciate that. Um, uh, you have some post-it notes on or near your chairs. I, walk, I invite you to, if you have any questions, any burning ideas, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns that we don't address in this, um, that you write them down. If you, there is a process that you would like the podcast to explore, um, how do you build a grant, or how do you build a board, um, how do you apply for grants, things like that, uh, write it down. Uh, I will have a couple of assistants here to collect those at the end of the day today. Um, uh, also, if you can write down, what does ensemble mean to you? Because that's a big part of what this uh, pro uh, podcast is as well, asking that question. Um, so first, without getting too far away from it, I want to talk a little bit about where this podcast come from, came from. Uh, uh, the Great Recession was a great time to take an internship. <laughs> I was at Actors Theater of Louisville, and I got this 30,000-foot view of how new plays were being made. Um, but what really got me excited was the Humana Festival of New American Plays, where they were commissioning ensembles to come in and do their work. Um, people from universes, people from uh, the Rude Mechanicals, City Company, um, uh, Dominic Sarand and the folks from the former Theatre de la Jeune Lune. These folks were all generating ensemble-based work. They were all commissioned, and they were all starting to uh, do something, finalize something, continue a project in and under the guise of Actors Theatre of Louisville's festival. Um, this process boggled my mind, especially as a Midwesterner who doesn't like to talk about money. And so the questions in my head was, were, how are they paying for this? How do these people who love each other, who want to work together, who are committed to working with each other and committed to a creative process together, really able to continue this even through one of the most uh, challenging times in our uh, financial history in America. Um, also, you have not lived until you see uh, Ann Bogart look over at Chuck Me and say, well, we're not going to do it that way, Chuck, <laughs> which was really exciting in, of, in and of itself. Um, uh, so throughout this entire process, I'm getting the chance to observe these things and really try to figure out how is it that this, these ensembles who are non or less hierarchically structured or, or non-patriarchically structured, how are they um, working within this sort of bigger top-down regional theater system model? And this is a big question for me even in 2008 and nine. Uh, 2010, I moved to Boston. Um, I start my own theater company. Uh, called Project Project Theater Ensemble. We're doing, we're answering, we're asking these questions of uh, uh, about uh, audience immersion. Um, in 2010, uh, uh, Sleep No More had just transferred. There we go. Uh, Sleep No More had just transferred from ART to New York, um, but it had its development process in a site-specific location in Boston. Um, everyone was really excited about it. It was a big question. And so when I came to town, I found a core of people who had similar questions about audience participation, but also ensemble-based work. So we got together and started talking about, let's pretend we talked about these folks. There we go. Uh, so we got together and started talking about how do we move from just making the theater participatory or just from immersion to something that's audience integrated? What, what would happen if, at the end of the day, the audience got to decide what the end of the play was? How do we make a play like that? How do we get an audience through a space? Um, at the same time, I had this awesome opportunity where TCG was in Boston, and it was my first TCG, and I was invited to be there, and I was so lucky to be there. I met some really awesome people who were also exploring this question through ensemble, through immersive practices, 
uh, uh, Rachel Grossman of Dog and Pony DC and Michael Rode of Sojourn Theater. Um, both of them really putting audience at the center of the play, uh, but still ensemble based. And so I spent a lot of time talking to them and trying to connect with them, but the person who really is the reason why I'm here today is Jerry Stropnicki from Bloomsburg Theater Ensemble. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yeah, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, if it wasn't for Jerry, I wouldn't be in this room, I wouldn't be having this conversation, and he said, um, you should, what are you doing for breakfast tomorrow? You should come to this meeting. And so I went to this meeting for the Network of Ensemble Theaters, and I was in a, an entire room full of ensemble-based theater makers, like, these are my people, <laughs> right? And so I finally realized, ah, yes, the way I want to make theater is also the way other people want to make theater. I was so jazzed and so interested in that. Um, so I pitched a howl around a bunch of ideas of things I wanted to do, uh, things I wanted to write to explore these opportunities and this immersion and this uh, ensemble-based work. So I got to interview some really awesome people. I got to interview um, Rachel Chaikin of the team and uh, Laurie McCants of Bloomsburg Theater Ensemble. Um, uh, oh my gosh, the list goes on and on. Katie Pearl and Lisa Demore of Pearl Demore. Um, just people all over the map who are doing things that I was so fascinated and so curious in. Um, so this is all of the groundwork for this podcast. So it's 2015, last leg of the journey, I promise. Uh, it's 2015, and I find that I am uh, I'm entering grad school, and in my final year, uh, I, I'm, st I'm still grappling with the idea of what is ensemble, what does it mean, um, and how do we continue to make it, and how do we continue to break down the fourth wall. Uh, it's my final year of grad school, and I decide that I'm going to do uh, an independent study trying to find... Uh, collaboratively created companies who are also doing work that is important to their community and that is also sustainable. And those things aren't necessarily on paper. Those things aren't reported necessarily on the website. The, they are mentioned, right? But I want to get deeper into these things. So I started compiling a list. That list turned into a bunch of vo uh, voice calls, uh, phone calls, voice calls, uh, a lot of calls. And what ended up happening was this podcast. And uh, almost 10 years to the day of uh, hearing Chuck Me get yelled at by Ann Bogart, I have the chance to interview Michael, Ro uh, Michael Fields from Commedia dell'arte. Um, and so it was a fantastic journey, and here we are. One, uh, the full year later, I had the chance, I started publishing, or HowlRound picked me up and started uh, uh, producing the podcast. So in short, those are like the, the takeaways that I, the journey that I have been on in leading up to the From the Ground Up podcast and where we are now. Um, these are just a few of the guests that we've had on our, on our, um, on our podcast. It had our, as in there was a collective our, my, the podcast, uh, Rachel Grossman and Colin K. Bills of Dog and Pony DC. Um, and I'm just going to share with you a few takeaways from these folks. Um, as I mentioned, they're really interested in audience integrated work. And so what they are interested in doing is, uh, is mo they're interested in multiple things, but audience integrated as in the audience makes the decisions, helps the audience, helps the story get to some sort of fruition by the end of the play. Um, and what they talk about principally is how do, what is the difference between participation and integration? And beyond that, immersion. What does immersion mean as well? So they had a really uh, great handle on that. Also, the way they title themselves. Uh, Rachel is the ringleader, which is, uh, and co-founder. Uh, ringleader is sort of in lieu of another title, such as artistic director or otherwise. Um, and she, uh, the, one of the things we talk about as well is that uh, that title is difficult to transfer from grant to grant to application to application. But as long as you're working within a strata, as long as you're explaining yourself well in your grant, it's not a problem. It's just a method of working. It's an individual fingerprint to how you make the work that you make. Um, your creative aesthetic. And it defines how they work together by calling herself a ringleader and ensemble director. Uh, Keita Sullivan of the New England Foundation for the Arts uh, talks about the process of the National Theatre Project. Uh, the National Theatre Project uh, takes 100, uh, gets around 100 applicants. They will it down to 24. From those 24, they get down to 12. And those 12 participants are not only get the awarded amount, uh, but they also get something called a thought partner. Uh, this thought partner is along with them every step of the way uh, to help them ask questions that they weren't thinking about, that they may not have known that they wanted to know. Uh, so how do you 
uh, I might not know how to, they might, as ensembles, we just tend to think we know everything or we have all these different perspectives from the group, but at the same time, sometimes we get into this congruous idea of like, we all agree with things or we start to all say yes to each other, yes, yes, yes. But it takes a thought partner outside of that to be incongruous and say, but have you thought about this? How are you gonna market that? Where are you gonna go? So they start to ask the big questions about how they actually plan to tour their show or beyond. Um, so just that thought partner is an extra person in the room with them. Koya Paz of Free Street Theater uh, works with an, an, nearly an entirely um, contributed, contributed income. Uh, their entire operating budget is almost entirely contributed. Uh, and the, and uh, they're entering their and they're entering their 50th year. So all along that time, it's always been contributed. They had they pioneered one of the first um, pay what you can. Uh, processes in uh, in Chicago, and uh, and they continue to find new ways of finding uh, the opportunity to make the, the make the theater in the neighborhoods, while also actually making it, building the sets, buying the paint, buying the lumber, um, buying the print materials, doing everything within the community that the work is going to be seen by. Um, so doing as much in the community as possible, bring it, bring it to them. She also explores the idea of knowing that we do not, sometimes the people who need to see theater uh, aren't the people who can afford to see theater or can travel to see theater. So making it in the communities that need to see it and that pay what you can model also allows someone to say, this dollar is what I can give, but also giving a value to the work that's being ha is happening is really important to her. Uh, Stephanie McKee of Junebug Productions in New Orleans talks about the blue sky, and I love this. Um, blue sky uh, really means to me and to her this idea of the abundance I I mentality, not the scarcity mentality. So often we're thinking, oh, we need to get that grant, we need this money, if we don't get this, we can't do that. Um, but she really talks about what is that blue sky? What is way out there? What can we do and how can we get there? And somewhere we're gonna, we're gonna do the show, but it's that blue sky idea of what the project might actually be. Um, that I took away from it. Uh, Michaela Petra and Lita Hoffman of Straw Dog Theater Company. Uh, Michaela talks about the opportunity of being invited to be an audience member. Uh, Straw Dog is a company that's been around for about 30 years. Um, some of the biggest names in Chicago have gone through Straw Dog, and um, they continually renew their membership. They are constantly bringing in new ensemble members. And so when Michaela was invited to be a member, she was elated. And that feeling of like, I'm committed to a company, my company is my family, and I can continue to do the artistic, awesome work that I want to be making, um, really hits her hard. And Lita Hoffman, who is their new artistic director, uh, speaks to the fact that sometimes you have to uh, spend money to make money. So uh, hiring a development officer, Having someone there who is gonna be conscientious of like, I'm gonna write a grant for this. We're gonna make this money. We're gonna employ these folks. Um, she also talks about, they own their space, they own a new space in Chicago, uh, and they rent it out to different companies. So the challenge of being sort of, not necessarily a landlord, but having to, the challenge of like, working with selling out spaces is a big, is a big problem. It also me means who's manning the space, who's, who's in the space, pardon me. Um, and finally, I'll end with Ova Salpeng of Tieta Productions. Uh, uh, Ova really opened our eyes with the idea of the cultural ambassador, always having someone in the room to talk about the experience of the bodies on stage. Um, they, they've been around for 20 years, and the principal uh, uh, work that they do is with immigrant communities, uh, themselves as immigrants as well, the idea being that they are generating work in the communities, for the communities, um, but also trying to find folks who are, if they can't cast the show with the right person on stage, they go, they don't, they either don't do the show, or they decide that they're gonna go out into the community and find that person. Find that person. The edit, added dedication to finding the right person to put into the show to tell that story is really key to that. So, that brings us up to today and our podcast. Um, uh, and I've got a really awesome, fantastic team with me today to interview. Uh, Flux Theater Ensemble. Uh, they've been exploring work since 2006. Their mission is to produce transformative theater that explores and awakens capacity for change. They believe 
that long-term collaboration and rigorous development can unite artists and audience to build a creative home in New York. Uh, they were presented with the Cafe Cinco Fellowship Award for consistent outstanding work, and in 2015, Backstage named them one of eight young and mighty New York theater companies. Uh, dear artists, please join me in welcoming co-founders and creative partners, Heather Cohn and Corinna Schulenberg. Um, so for questions and beyond, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions, um, but uh, do let us know, um, because of the live podcasting nature of this, we all have to use the microphone in some capacity, so I want to, I will probably repeat your question back into the mic, okay? Uh, hi. hi, welcome, thanks for being here, even though we've been here all week, right? <laughs> some, of, some of us longer, yes. Um, so I just really want to start just tell us about Flux Theater Ensemble. How did you come about to begin with? No, I want you to start. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I think the interesting thing about origin stories for ensembles, or at least how I feel about ensembles, is that they are continually renewed. Each time a new person joins an ensemble where a person is more than just the role they're being hired for, uh, the ensemble changes fundamentally. And so I feel like we have multiple origin stories. <laughs> um, it is true that the original origin story had to do with um, a playwriting opportunity that I had that grew into Flex, but that's really just one origin story. And if there were different creative partners here, um, they would share those different origin stories for themselves. And all of those stories in our totally non-hierarchical ensemble are equal and beloved. I can add to that. Um, just to a term uh, that Corona just used is creative partner. Uh, that is what we call our ensemble members. So we are um, a community of creative partners. We are each a creative partner. So we, um, again, it's a non-hierarchical structure that we have. We are all artists. We are all administrators. Um, we all wear many, many hats. Um, and I will just add, it, it, yes, I agree uh, with that multiple origin, but also that original team um, who put together the, the first production before Flux was actually Flux. Uh, we faced many, many obstacles <laughs> from the uh, venue that was hosting us. Um, there were some very unique challenges and of course in a difficult situation where you have to bond together to overcome these challenges, including a, um, in the middle of our tech uh, being told we had to clear out of the space for a spaghetti dinner fundraiser which then grew into an ongoing tradition of showing up sometime in the middle of our tech with a spaghetti dinner for the creative team because that's what you do in the middle of tech. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, you said the term right off the bat, um, artist administrators or something. You're all the artists, you're all the administrators. Um, is there anyone who is full-time admin or do you all sort of spread that admin work across the board in some capacity? Um, yes, I should say we all have other, uh, we all have jobs, um, at day jobs, so we don't have a salaried staff, um, and no, there is not a single administrative <laughs> person, it really is spread, um, based on, again, who in the current creative partnership, uh, both skills and interest based, so, um, the people who have certain skills, you know, we do encourage them to uh, contribute in that way, but also respond to everyone's interests. So if there's something that they want to do um, and actually don't have a lot of experience with, Flux is a space to, to learn and grow. Yeah, I also want to add that while we do share things totally equitably, Heather does a ton of work. <laughs> Uh, and it's always really important to name that. You know, even if you imagine ensemble as a gift you give to each other, if you notice that certain people are giving a lot more of that gift to each other, <laughs> the very least you can do is name it, right? And then look to figure out ways to share it a little bit more equitably. 
Um, and I think one of the things that's really cool about how leadership manifests in an ensemble where we are really giving this as a gift to each other is that people do move back and move forward. Um, and particularly when new people join the creative partnership, it takes them a while to acclimate to the idea that they are the leaders of the ensemble. <laughs> there's usually an expectation that there's a hierarchy, um, and there is, but it's one based on relationship that we're constantly navigating and naming. Um, but then eventually, there is an awareness that, oh yeah, I can lead this organization, and I feel like we're in a really beautiful moment now where folks who have been in the ensemble for a few years are really, really now fully stepping into their leadership, and it's like, ooh, it's exciting. Cool. Um, you said you'd found your way there by a playwriting opportunity. But you had both co-founded it. Were you? Did you co? Did you create it so that for the playwriting opportunities or for creative expression amongst yourselves and with the team? Or like, yeah, yeah. Anything to explore that a little more? Start. Try. Um, yeah. I mean, I would love to say we all came together, had a brilliant mission and started a company that had a vision and values and all these things. Um, but that wouldn't really be the full truth. It really was, there was a group of us that came together to produce um, a play of Corinna's. And uh, we really enjoyed working with each other and we really didn't enjoy every other aspect of that because of the particulars of the um, uh, venue and producing entity. And so we said, we really want to do this again together, um, but maybe without <laughs> them, how do we do that? And we said, oh, we'll start a company. I mean, it was really that kind of that simple. It was pretty hilarious as you were like reading our, our mission and stuff and like both Heather and I were like, oh no, that's not, <laughs> do you know, but no, I mean, because like, um, I just feel like we're evolving so, so constantly all the time. Um, and it's so relational, relationship, you know, relational to us as an ensemble and a relational, relational to the communities of which we're a part, that like, you're like, oh right, we have to go back and update that <laughs> mission and all of that stuff, because in some ways it is for us, but in other ways it's not for us, you know, it's for other people. Um, but like, that's a whole thing we could talk about longer, only if it's useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the big, thing that I am so curious about and so since we're on this world of admin and world of like creative opportunities within uh, connected to admin uh, the thing that I'm I think is on all of our minds or at least mine is this living ticket model that um, that I am so enthused by and I have a I took a I took a screenshot of it here. Yeah, so just so we can take a look and if anyone wants to see um, you can also find this on uh, Flux's website um, uh, yeah, can you walk us through a little bit? I know I could probably bring it up and scroll through it if you'd like, but is there anything, what are we looking at? Um, and uh, who gets to see this? I mean, it's on the internet, but where else, how else is it distributed? Yeah, um, so our living ticket, can I explain a little bit what the yes. living ticket is? Sure. And Okay, great. Um, Unless you want to do that. No, it's like exciting when you see a budget, you're like, hmm. But yeah, <laughs> so we'll explain what, what this is doing there. Um, so I think it was in 2015 where we, um, for those who are familiar with the New York theater scene, we operated under the showcase code, uh, which is with the Acro Actors' Equity, which at that time set a uh, ticket maximum at $18, was the maximum you could charge um, for a ticket. And we were finding ourselves that um, sort of two things were happening. One, we felt like uh, we were not growing in terms of earned income. We were sort of plateauing um, in terms of audience growth and ticket income. Um, and also that our values as an ensemble, um, really our core values were not uh, at all ref like reflective of this sort of transactional thing that was $18, but actually if you had a discount code, it was 15, or you know maybe you could get in for 12, and like it was kind of meaningless and it didn't feel good um, 
in terms of our, our, our values around equity and wanting um, anybody really to be able to come to see a flex show who wanted to. So we sort of had a, we do an annual retreat every August. Um, one year it was in July because uh, I was super pregnant and was gonna <laughs> not be able to do it in August. Um, but where we uh, really dig into like the bigger questions, the, the planning, the hard conversations. We have the hard conversations every, all the time, but really dig into them. Um, and we sort of dedicated that particular retreat to tackling this and what we were gonna do about uh, where we were. And I'm gonna pass it off to you because I feel like I've been talking to explain what came out of it. Yeah, so I think there were, in addition to what Heather shared, a few core things that we were trying to address. And the first was that the lack of transparency around pay in the theater field disempowers artists. People often go to a show, they feel like they're giving, you know, they're paying a lot, but they have no idea <laughs> that that is actually nowhere near enough for the artist to get a living wage, right? And so part of what we wanted to do was to just make it all very transparent. You know, here's how much we pay. It is not a living wage, it's not even a minimum wage. And to get it to a living wage, here's how much it would cost, right? So the idea of it being a living ticket was to try to make transparent what a living wage would look like. At the same time though, we live in a country um, with profound income inequality that is racialized, that is gendered, and we did not want to be in a place where getting to that living wage um, happened in an inequitable fashion. So, you know, taking inspiration from a pay what you can model, the idea was you don't have to have a financial transaction to see one of our shows. You can just come. However, if you do come and you do value the work on stage, you have some accountability right, to support it, to support the artists so that the artists, the people making the work, the people administrating the work, who for us are the same people, can live. And the idea would be that some people would give a lot more and because they had more, and then other people would be giving of their time and attention, which was also really deeply valuable to us. Um, and so it was from conversations around those problems that we arrived at the living ticket. Um, do you want to talk us through the, like, the three budget columns, or do you want me to? Uh, whatever. Go. Okay. <laughs> um, so you'll see that there are three here. Um, basically, the current budget, that is like, that's our actual budget. Um, then there's a minimum wage budget, and then there's a living wage budget. And so the minimum wage budget is, bu is based on um, New York City's living wage, which has increased over the past couple years, which is great. The living wage is actually based on, uh, there's a calculator that looks at the actual cost of living in an area and what it would actually cost, I and mean, what it would actually take to, to, to live and not just barely survive in a city. And so that's the living wage column. And it goes all the way down for all the different areas that we have. Um, it's also important to note that within those artist and technical fees, um, there's a, a commitment to equity there as well, um, except in unusual circumstances, everybody makes the same, um, regardless of what they are doing uh, for the play. Um, and again, that's, I feel like I'm getting inspired. Yeah. Everyone will be paid equitably. <laughs> feel the music. I mean, yeah. I will say though that this is what equity feels like to me. It feels beautiful, it feels like a harmony. And it actually feels very dissonant when I'm in spaces where that's not the priority. Um, which, I mean, we didn't plan this. <laughs> Down with you, inequity. All right, so, um, <laughs> so the, those are the commitments that you see in this budget. And you know, the, the goal was, I mean, I feel like for me, and one of the things is like we're an ensemble that does not agree with each other a lot of the time. <laughs> and like actually don't feel like agreement is necessarily necessary for consensus process. It's about like, do I need to stand in the way of this decision or do I not, right? Um, so, but my perspective of this um, is that uh, primarily this was about us being right with ourselves. What do we believe? What, what is the relationship we want with our community? And then if there are additional benefits, good. 
Um, and if you know it totally collapses, then we need to radically rethink things. But thankfully, it did not. Yeah, I think, and just to, I think you, I'm not sure if you said it exactly, but where we sort of landed was the idea of being um, transparent with our budgets and showing the the goal, like where we would like to be, and then that that gray section up the top where it says average living ticket gift to get there was calculated um, for each show depending on uh, capacity, you know, number of seats in the house, um, per number of performances, sort of based at a calculation of if each seat were filled by somebody um, donating X amount, we could reach a minimum wage, we could reach a living wage. So that that's sort of how it, um, what that means up there. Um, and we found, oh, I might be already launching into your next question. No, no, keep going. Okay. Uh, and what we found was, you know, there were committed flex audience members who'd been coming to our shows for years and paying $18, you know, plus the service charge or whatever, who suddenly were, you know, would give $75, $80, um, which was very moving. Um, and, and, and then we also found we were able to uh, bring in student groups, bring in other groups, people who, and, and say, yes, we, we, we want you here. And it's not like, Oh yeah, I guess we can, you know, give you some comps. It was like, no, this is the this is the point of this. Like, please come. Um, and I remember we have a, a group now that's been to several of our shows from uh, Hostos Community College in the Bronx, and um, we have a, a relationship with a theater teacher there, theater professor there, and. Um, and I remember they there was they came to see a show that we did. Was it only in 2018? Am I dead? Which one? Am I dead? Am I dead? 2018. Yeah, um, a show by Kevin R. Free called "Am I Dead: The Untrue Narrative of Anatomical Lewis, the Slave." Uh, and these students came and they were like, "We we heard about this. You know, what, can can we give a dollar? Can we don't you know? Can I put in two dollars somewhere?" And I mean, it was just, it was really incredible um, that they, they wanted to give something. Yeah, just to add to that, I feel like there's like a lot of ticket discounting programs where it feels like they're doing you a favor. You know, like, aren't you lucky <laughs> that we're gonna discount this so that you can be in our audience? Um, and that dynamic is a weird dynamic, particularly when you're making work for communities who definitely don't have that money. Um, you know, the, the last show we did, I was really grateful as a trans person that we had a lot of trans and non-binary people um, in those, in, in, you know, coming to see the show. Um, and it, it was really meaningful to me that they didn't have to sweat it, you know, because transition is super expensive. <laughs> um, and trans people are really, um, you know, facing significant economic challenges. So what's important is, you know, you, you don't make it like, you don't have to make somebody feel bad about coming to see your show and not having money. They should feel good about coming to see your show and not having money, because then being in your theater is, that is the gift, right? Have you found there to be any disadvantages of putting this out there? Disadvantage, no. Challenges, yes. Yeah. Today. I mean, uh, two very specific challenges is, um, you know, the, we do see a higher no-show rate um, because people will, you, you, so we still invite people to reserve their living ticket in advance even if there is no transa financial transaction so that we, you know, hopefully have a sense of <laughs> how many people are gonna be in, in the room. Um, and we, do, we did find a higher no-show no rate. Um, which is a challenge, because then um, you know we, the, we want to make sure anyone who wants to come that there's space. And then if you find you know oh we thought we were sold out quote unquote, uh, and there was actually you know open seats, um, that's difficult. So we start we send um, pre-show emails now that are very clear where it's like you know even though this maybe didn't cost you anything, the value of this seat is you know, important. And like please let us know if your plans have changed and. That's been semi-effective. Um, 
And I would say the other like very specific challenge is we, so we don't have our own theater venue, obviously by this budget. Um, we, rent, <laughs> um, we rent spaces for each production and uh, watching venues who part of their contract uh, is you're using our ticketing system, trying to like work with us and navigate like, what do we do with you? What is this living ticket thing? how are we, this doesn't work at all with our system, has been interesting. And uh, I think we've had opportunity to educate and learn together. Um, you know, and I will say the, the, the two that I'm thinking of where it, it was a challenge and, you know, ultimately maybe wasn't exactly what we wanted it to be. They, they were willing to work with us, they listened, and I think that it opened their eyes a little bit to um, things that they just sort of, assumed and took for granted and like this is just how we always do it um but it but it was interesting with our most recent venue actually they were all about it they were like yes so we want to do this for you how you know we'll we'll set it up in our in our thing and then they you know it was the um the legal hand that came in at some point and was like well but you you can't collect donations for another organization so it became um that that became the problem they were like because the the whoever it was, you know, their legal counsel was saying, you know, if, we're, if you're using the venue's ticketing system and then collecting donations, as they saw it for a different company, like that was a problem, so. Yeah, the only other challenge that I would add is related to the commitment to equity and pay. Um, so we had for a long time worked with a press agent that we really loved and they, they did a great job for us. Um, but we paid them much more than we paid anybody else in, in, in the company, significantly more. Um, and so we stopped doing that and we stopped having a press agent. We continue to do our best, <laughs> you know, in a landscape that's already pretty challenging from a press perspective, and we're definitely doing less well than we had done when we had a press agent, which really isn't a surprise. Um, but there is a sense of like, even though we know what, what we're about and we know what our values are, then when you really hit that place of, oh, we're getting less exposure, you feel it, you do. And that's where your, your values get um, really interesting in a consensus model <laughs> where, where not everyone agrees that that sacrifice is worth it. Um, I failed to find out whether or not, you are incorporated, you're a 501c3, so you must have a board, correct? Legally required to, yes. Um, I, am, I am curious how your board feels about this and what did they say when you um, said, hey, we'd like to expose our checkbook? Uh, we have kept the board intentionally very small. It has been on the planning to-do list to grow the board for many years. Um, and we haven't. Uh, so, so they didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> sort of in the short, the the short, very vague response to that. Um, but I think that we, uh, I don't want to speak for you, but we, you know, we both have experience working for much larger um, not-for-profit theaters in the model that we are all, you know, used to and the challenges of working with boards. And I think because we sort of felt like um, the creative partnership provided similar sort of checks and balances and, um, you know, we all, the creative partners all vote on the budget in the way that a, a board would. And we, we recognize that how, you know, it's somewhat problematic. Um, but other other decisions that normally you think of a board making the creative partnership, the creative partners kind of work on that level as well. Um, so I think we really have maintained the board as the like the legal requirement, necessary minimum, um, and haven't really you know dedicated the the time to growing it. Do you want to say anything else on that? I want to say something that's like kind of related, but also not, <laughs> um, which speaks to, I think, the pressures that um, you face working in theater to conform to a corporate model. Um, and one of the things that I think is um, a challenge there is there is this expectation that power operates most efficiently within a hierarchy. 
Um, and so that ensemble work is seen as perhaps ethically superior, but ultimately inefficient, right, in our capitalist society and therefore less good. And you'll, you'll, I will have often witness people I really respect going, oh yeah, but if we're collaborative, it's gonna take too long, right? And what, and what I really believe, what I really believe, and I've witnessed it as we've gotten better at it, right? Because um, it was true maybe for a little while, but we've gotten better at it. That when you have a really functioning uh, a collective, it is actually more efficient. And the reason why is I feel like with decisions, you either pay before or you pay after. Right? So you can pay before, which is doing the work of involving everyone who has a stake in the decision, and then everyone has ownership of that decision and understanding on how to act on that decision, or you can pay after, when your super hierarchical decision meets the realities that it was totally uninformed and that nobody actually wants to do any of that. <laughs> you know? So like, I would rather pay before, and I feel like we have an opportunity as ensemble artists or people who like to work collaboratively to really change that totally faulty assumption about efficiency, that problematic word, as it relates to ensemble practice. Yeah, I like that a lot. One of the, one of the things that we're trying to explore is sustainability through this podcast. So sustainably, uh, not just um, economically, but artistically and uh, personally and uh, emotionally. Um, uh, I, I have one more question that I sort of want to change our conversation to your process a little bit more, but I'm wondering if you can give me a percentage or if you feel free giving me the amount, what is your earned versus contributed income? And um, <laughs> flip the page. And what, uh, and I suppose that dramatically alters how this is looked at then. Yeah, um, so it definitely shifted after we implemented the living ticket. Um, and now, so I'm just gonna give you the last two fiscal years. Uh, so um, FY17, we were, 17% uh, was earned and the rest was contributed. And then 18, um, it's actually 12% earned. Uh, so predominantly contributed income. Um, Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, you talk a little bit about how, um, so I want to get into a process a little bit, and of, you know, uh, ensembles don't always devise. Uh, some ensembles bring in playwrights and, or, or have the, the sort of uh, submission process of some nature, uh, or some just use the insular, like an ensemble member is going to pitch a project that they're really interested in. Um, how do you, but you use, uh, you seek out playwrights very frequently, is that, yes? Yeah, so I would say the, the bulk of the work that we do is uh, in a traditional playwright model, although there are exceptions that have been deeply meaningful to us. Um, we have had devised processes around responding to migrant justice um, that led to some work for us devised processes around uh, responding to racialized violence after the acquittal of George Zimmerman that was deeply uh, important for us. So we do use devised work, and in particular, I think when the community feels like it needs a whole bunch of voices to process things. And um, we do a lot of work in a traditional playwright model. However, <laughs> um, one of the places where we're really struggling, I think, um, is that I am a playwright, and a lot of the plays that Flux has done are my plays. I don't know how many. I don't know if it's more than half or less than, maybe. It's probably less than, but it's close to 50, 50 I don't know. It's less than. It's less than. And so I um, am very, very comfortable with writing for specific actors and having those actors deeply inform and change their character arcs, right? Which is particularly important for me as a uh, white playwright when I am writing for my creative partners of color. Um, there's actually, I don't know a responsible way to do it in a traditional playwright hierarchy, right? Where the playwright's words are valued more than the actor's body, which is what we are usually dealing with. In this environment, I do believe you can create that way um, ethically. Um, however, most playwrights are not used to that kind of collaborative environment. Um, 
And so there's always a process for us where we try to figure out how are we going to get our uh, playwrights that we really want to write for the ensemble used to rooms where people are going to uh, speak with some agency about crafting the narratives that their bodies are asked to perform. Um, and so we've actually done some, created some programs around that, programs that are specifically designed to um, make a more substantive relationship between a playwright and an ensemble. Um, uh, the most recent was called the Flux Forward program, and we commissioned four playwrights to write for the ensemble. Of them, we are, are have done or are about to do, uh, we've done three of those four. So Adam Simkowitz's uh, Marion, uh, Kevin Air Free's Am I Dead? Do you want to do the full one, well, the full title? It's just uh, Marion or the True Tale of Robin Hood. Yeah, it's an awesome play. Um, or Kevin R. Free's play, Am I Dead? Um, and we're about to do Nandita Shinoy's uh, Rage play in the, in the near future that play is going to be produced. Um, and in each of those relationships, you know, there was, there was some things that went well and some things that didn't go well in terms of that playwright um, uh, actor, director, ensemble relationship. And I think the thing that we really, really need is, or I'm hoping for, <laughs> is to have more playwrights join the creative partnership who, who share those values of collective creation that is still, you know, maybe playwright driven overall, but deeply responsive to and in co-creation with uh, the actors and directors and designers. I have nothing to add to that. Um, and also, I want to lean into, you had mentioned the idea that when you have new company members come in, when you have no new, uh, the revitalization of the group and how it changes, can you talk a little bit about how your company has changed over time and how, a little bit, maybe, <laughs> maybe to a misnomer, but yeah, anything about relating to how Ensemble has changed over time for you and what maybe um, your titles have meant over time. Yes, no, absolutely. So creative partner is not what we started with 13, was it 13 years ago? Um, we had a you know very, I think, well-intentioned but severely misguided sort of two-tier structure of um, ensemble membership. Um, so there was, what was it? It was like full and associate or something so ridiculous. So, um, you know, we were figuring it out. Uh, and so, we, yeah, so we had, so had this two-tier thing, which, um, as you can imagine, like, w revealed to be more and more problematic. And, um, and so, you know, eventually it sort of imploded and we, um, there was a sort of period of attrition and uh, regeneration, and this is, I think, goes back to the multiple origin stories, um, and we came to the, uh, you know, that if you, if you don't have full um, uh, ownership of something, you know, they, how can you put your full self into it? Uh, so we, that's where we sort of came to the creative partner structure, um, which I think is, is much, much better, um, you know, uh, in terms of really being non-hierarchical and um, uh, consensus-based as much as possible. Um, what was the second part of the question? I think I lost track. Great, titles, yeah. I know, don't you all want to be in that room? What's <laughs> happening? It sounds really cool. It does sound cool. Um, yeah, and then we did have, I mean, we, we did sort of have titles, uh, sort of more traditional titles previously as well um, uh, that, that, you know, we have been able to remove. But I think that two of us being uh, co-founders, like that, that title, you know, is, it still holds a lot of weight. Um, and fortunately, the current creative partnership, I think, you know, everybody feels uh, very much like that is their ensemble too. And even if, you know, the, all, the, all the folks who are not co-founders, but, but I find myself wondering, you know, like, especially I think when you're at an event like this, being reminded of like that founder syndrome thing and I'm like well that's you know that's us and and so we are we are actually thinking about like well what is the next 
you know, what is the next step for Flex? What is the next phase of Flex? Are what what do you you know where where we live in that um, journey? So I think it is it is constantly evolving, and I think it's constantly evolving because while yes, that's our mission statement, like what we are is the people who are in the ensemble. I mean, and that is how what yeah, it, the people are more important than the role. Yeah, and I would just say that um, what I think has been really beautiful for me to witness is the deepening commitment to collective care being at the heart of the ensemble. You know, when we when we were in the early going and often when a new wave enters into the ensemble, there is absolutely a, a, a scarcity model that is the norm, right? Where I'm gonna use the ensemble to get mine, <laughs> right? And that's natural, right? We live in, as much as we would like to believe a place of abundance, it can often not feel that way. Um, but what happens is over time, I think each of us has felt ever more committed to the care of the other so that like season discussions, which used to be about like, when am I gonna get my awesome <laughs> role? are now you don't actually need to ever say that because your other creative partners absolutely know you weren't in the last two shows and so they're never going to choose a show that wouldn't have an amazing role for you in it. It's taken a long time to get to that place where there's that really that long-term trust in each other. Um, and I think what's also really beautiful is that um, from the ensemble, there have been a lot of marriages, <laughs> a lot of children that are a result of the ensemble, both within the creative partners and people that we have collaborated with uh, for an extended period of time. And I just wonder what kind of a world where it would, would it be? <laughs> where like on a grant application that was valued, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That like uh, this ensemble has been a driver of love and family and like the continuation of relationship in a deeply meaningful way. Like that would be fun to put on a grant application. I know that people would be like, you know, would actually be like, wow, that's amazing. Cause I feel like it's amazing. I feel like it's what matters, you know? What a great expression. Um, I have plenty of more questions, but I want to toss the ball back out into the audience. Does anyone at this point in time have a question? Yeah, you can feel free to ask it now. It's just to occupy your hands while you're thinking. Oh, I'll repeat it back. Yeah. Did you set a deadline for the living ticket? And did you, how long did you agree to give it a trial period, if any? We did. It was like one show first, right? I think. Yeah, yeah I think we, 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 we decided we were going to try it for a show and <laughs> see what happened. Um, you know, and, and for that first show, um, we, you know, didn't lose m money. I mean, in that, I mean, we lost money, but, <laughs> but we didn't, um, I guess, make less, uh, you know, in the, in the end than we had been. So we're like, all right, there's something here. Um, and so then we continued it for the next show. And then I think then it was like, well, now it, it yeah, it's, um, it, we, we would never go back, um, you know, even though there are things that have not, um, I mean, we're not, we are not at a point where we're, you know, able to pay a living wage. And I think, or, you know, secretly we're like, oh, maybe that all just happened, you know, and, and that was, I think, naive, but. Thank you. Yes. Have you been able to get to the minimum wage? Have you been able to get to the minimum wage? No. Um, but I think that the way we can has to do with length of run and or um, size of space. Um, because we are in 99 seat or under theaters um, and because we're prescribed a certain length of run, it's difficult to like make enough so that you've also covered the cost of the actual development process. Um, however, I think that, you know, probably that is the next act for us, is to find a play or find some support, right, to allow us to take that risk where we know we're gonna run a longer time. Because usually what, I mean, I'm sure this is true for all of you, like, who are like us, 
it's by the end of the run that all of a sudden the word of mouth is hot, 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 you know, you're, you're full up, and you absolutely could run for an extended period of time, but by then it's like too late. So I think that's what's next for us. Uh, I mean, because we rent spaces, yeah, so we, I mean, we actually, are, the last show we did, it was exactly this situation, and we said, hey, c can we extend? And they said, no, we have somebody else loading in on Monday. I mean, it, it's that, yeah. Yeah, great. Any other questions? Yeah. How, uh, how many projects are you developing at one time, and how far out do you plan? How many projects are you developing at one time, and how far out do you plan on those? When we're doing awesome, we're like two or three years out. We are often not doing awesome. <laughs> um, we are very often in a place where we're, um, you know, and part of it I think is that uh, we're, we, you know, we are not immune from the perfectionism that is at the heart of white supremacy culture. So we're like, can't this play just be perfect and meet all our needs? But no, of course not, right? Um, and so, and so I do think that the the places where we've been really strong are places where we have had, you know, like a number of pieces in development that we knew we were going to land, but then we kind of run out of them, you know, and and we haven't yet gotten to a place where the renewal of those projects is is uh, the same all the time, but I do think that that is a goal that we're going to be talking about at our next retreat. Yeah, I'll just add um, that a, a program we used to have, which, yeah, um, which we have, it has been dormant, let's say dormant, um, you know, <laughs> hopefully we'll come back someday, but as a program called Flux Sundays, where we really were meeting almost every Sunday when you're not, when we weren't in production, to, um, with playwrights who are in our Friends of Flux circle, so we kind of think of the ensemble as concentric circles, or the creative partners at the the core center and then you know, this sort of friends of flux circle of uh, collaborators and donors and audience members where there's often overlap um, surrounding. And uh, we would get together for three hours on a Sunday afternoon, playwrights that we'd been working with would bring in new pages um, that they were developing. We would put it on its feet immediately. There was no sit around and read it. It was just like, go make choices, be bold. Um, you know, there were probably three or four different groups of people working on different scripts at a time. And that really was our pipeline for a long time. Um, and we developed entire shows through this Flux Sunday process. Uh, and we, for just life reasons and space reasons, um, you know, that's not an active program right now. Um, and so we sort of, the flux forward was kind of the next phase where we really were committed to these four writers and whatever length of time that process would take for them and, and really wanting to, or intending to, um, produce those plays once they were finished. And each of them has taken its own sort of um, length of time. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's the biggest project that you've taken on, and how, have, how has working on an ensemble benefited you in, yeah. in, taking, on in taking on that project? Mm -hmm. Thank you. But that's not what you were going to say, right? A different one, yeah. Um, sure. Uh, so right during... Um, the uh, 2009 <laughs> um, financial crisis, um, we decided to produce a trilogy um, and in rep. Um, <laughs> why? <laughs> I, I, I don't have to say anything else, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, Jonna Adams, um, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's the, the, the writer. The, the pain of the crisis. I know. Um, it's the writer. Um, and yeah, we, we did a trilogy in rep. Uh, and I think, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, what? 
how did the ensemble sort of get us through that? It was that kind of the question. Um, it's a really good question. Um, I, th I think it taught us a lot. I mean, besides just being insane um, uh, to do, I think it taught us a lot about what kind of collaborators we wanted to be working with. And um, even uh, within the trilogy, we actually had three, we had three different directors, right? Yeah, so we had three different directors, <laughs> one for each of the shows. Um, but the same design team um, and sort of watching each of those directors work differently with the same design team, I think uh, really shed light on the things that we wanted to keep and the, and the ways of working that we, that, um, that we didn't want to hold on to. Uh, and then we never did a trilogy again. But then we did two shows in rep still later. I don't know. That's good. Really? Oh, no, there might be another question. Yeah. We have time for maybe one more question, and then I'll enter our final round. Yeah. Has it adjusted uh, other funding that you've received? Has the Living Ticket model adjusted any other funding that you've received? Specifically in, like, donations. Specifically yes. donations or gifts. Um, I think that, you know, as far as like bottom line, I, that maybe we've gotten um, a few foundation grants that maybe uh, we wouldn't have gotten, but like who really knows um, if that's true. I mean, nothing that was so specific. Well, it's not exactly true. We did uh, apply for one grant that was kind of a, can you help sort of subsidize this, um, this program? Um, but I think in terms of, yeah, in terms of the individual donations, it, it, it really put it sort of back on people to, to really ask themselves, like, well, what, you know, what can I give? Um, instead of on us, like, hey, can you give us $50? Can you give us 25 Right, but it, it, it makes um, the, the donor kind of have to, I don't know, really take ownership of that in any way. Is that... I don't feel, um, and I think we actually did the math on this a couple years back, but I don't think that it has um, impacted our individual donors giving, say, at an end-of-year campaign. My memory of that is that they continue to give at much the same levels, and now also did. Those who had resources to do so gave more um, to see the shows, but that, that's my memory of it. It's been a couple years since we've run an analysis on it, um, but I remember it being good news because we kept going. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna enter, we've just entered the lightning round. Uh, so I'm gonna ask these folks some questions that hopefully they don't have to think too hard about uh, to bring us back to uh, wrap us up this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, so first, I wanna know, what is your favorite salutation? Can I be transparent in the spirit of Living ticket transparency. So, uh, so this lightning round, we don't have to think, but we actually got these questions in advance. <laughs> so I thought, I thought Jeff meant like, um, like what I like to be called, um, <laughs> like, um, in, in terms of yeah, salutation. Um, but now understanding that's not actually what the intention was. Um, I guess mine would be, I, I mean, something I use is sort of like, hey team. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> whenever we're emailing other creative partners, it's CPs, comma. <laughs> yeah. CPs, yeah. Uh, favorite exclamation? Who boy. That's it. That's the one. That's what I do. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I, I have a loud laugh. That's, that's my exclamation. <laughs> <laughs> favorite, favorite transportation? My feet. I get motion sick and most any other <laughs> form of transportation. So I like my feet. I'm a weirdo who loves, loves, loves the New York City subway system. <laughs> what would you be doing if not theater? I think some kind of international relations, um, conflict resolution uh, work. Something like that. 
physics? <laughs> <laughs> Something light? Yeah. I, I regret it. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, what does ensemble mean to you? I, I really think the, the collective care that like we just have to remember that we're people and like that's actually at the most important piece of all of it. Um, yeah. Love, 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 love. Thank you. Um, your favorite ice cream. And this has been a dividing line on ensembles in the world, I'm telling you right now. Uh, I think coconut. <laughs> don't hate me, but I don't like ice cream. <laughs> That's okay. Do you have a favorite frosty treat? I don't like sweet things. I'm a spicy person. I like things spicy and bitter. Yes. Awesome. We learn a lot about each other, don't we, in these, in these moments. Uh, hey, folks, uh, to our audience and to uh, uh, Heather and Corinna, I want to say thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for joining us. I want to say some really quick thank yous to HowlRound and my produ producer, J.D. Stokely. Uh, uh, all the conference wizards here at TCG, thank you so much. Uh, and I want to say um, also uh, Lily and uh, uh, Colette for being here from our Milwaukee Rep Teen Council and giving me a hand this week. That's been so helpful. Um, so thank you. Uh, that's all I've got for now. We'll be here to mingle for a little bit. So please, uh, next, we'll see you next time on From the Ground Up. Thank you.